Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Des Moines Arts Center. I'm Jeff Fleming, the director of the Arts Center. It's my great pleasure to have you here. Uh, we are thrilled tonight to have Carla Black, who currently lives and works in Glasgow, Scotland. Wait till you hear her accent. Um, we're here to install the first one-person exhibition of her work in the United States, which continues the ongoing leadership of this institution in the dialogues surrounding contemporary art. This exhibition in many ways defies description and this is how Carla intends it. She prioritizes a sensuous experience, steadfastly maintaining that language is not adequate to convey the experience of engaging her often fragile and sometimes massive installations and freestanding sculptures. Made a diverse and an usual materials for art making, such as lipstick and body lotion. Her work is both beautiful and enigmatic. The exhibition comprises a new site-specific installations in the Art Center's IMP building, right above us, and conversations between art objects from our permanent collections and Carla's sculptures in the Anna K. Meredith Gallery. Carla's work has been exhibited widely and collected by major institutions, such as Tate Modern, the Scottish National Gallery of Art, the Guggenheim Museum, the Hammer Museum at UCLA, among others, and of course, the Des Moines Art Center. She was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2011. And as usual, I would also like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather tonight is the traditional and ancestral land of the Native Americans who preceded us, and we honor those who are still with us. So please welcome now, Carla Black. Hello, should I begin by just apologizing about my accent? And I see, can, can you hear me? Yeah, and um, if I talk too fast and you can't understand, then let me know. Because um, Scottish people, when they get a bit nervous and excited, just run all the words together. Yeah, so that's not, that's not gonna help us tonight. Um, so I'll just begin by saying that, um, you know, I'm quite adamant that, that um, I make sculpture and um, that can be quite a difficult thing to accept for people looking at the work. Um, it skirts close to other mediums like uh, performance art, painting, installation. And I guess when you look at it, you, you know, you might think it's only either almost sculpture or only just sculpture. Um, but I suppose for, for me, um, sculpture, is most interesting when it sort of within itself accepts the fact that um, the object is a, is a fallacy, um, that, um, excuse me, sorry, material, I suppose material in this world is only ever um, either sort of flying together or flying apart and it's only our sort of limited, the, the limited experience we can have of time, I suppose, uh, as uh, human beings that would sort of lead us to believe that an object is, a, is permanent. Also, so you can see in, in my work, I use very sort of material in its, in its raw state. Um, and I love things like powders, pastes, oils, creams, gels, really because I can sort of um, retard them in their raw state and so retain within them some sort of life or, you know, some sort of potential for transformation. 
Um, oftentimes, I suppose, when my work is written about, um, you know, critics would pick out the sort of unconventional materials within it, like maybe there's some cosmetics, like a bit of eyeshadow or some toiletries. Um, but as, when I think about my work, I think, you know, it's really, it's made from very traditional art making materials like um, plaster, powder, chalk, paint, paper. And I think that, that the other more sort of unconventional materials that are there are really a small amount that often would just sort of make up details. But, um, you know, I don't differentiate between sort of um, what are seen to be sort of art making materials and um, maybe sort of cosmetics like eyeshadow or, um, you know, some, some lipstick or something as, a, as opposed to, to paint because it's all just kind of made up anyway. You know, it's like, well, sort of art making materials are just sort of packaged as such and sold in a shop, you know, the same as like eyeshadow is packaged and it's just sold in a different shop. But, I, you know, I just sort of, I don't sort of differentiate between sort of natural materials or cultural materials either and I just um, use the materials for their um, physical properties just for example like how well a powder will attach itself to a piece of paper. Um, so in saying that um, it's very important to me that my, my work is sculpture. I guess another reason for that is that um, it is sculpture as a medium that in the sort of 50s, 60s and 70s, I suppose, really um, explodes itself into all the new forms. So like performance art, video art, sound art, land art, um, installation, all, all of those um, new forms come out of the medium of sculpture as a sort of medium of um, mass and space, I suppose. But what I'm trying to do is, I want to, um, you know, get in amongst all of that experimentation that explodes out of that medium. But I feel like um, what gets lost a bit at that point, possibly in postmodernism, is um, aesthetics. So I guess what I'm trying to do is uh, take all that experimentation where I can have the sort of loose material and the open gesture um, and all of that life, I suppose, that comes out of that and then try to sort of pull it back, bring it back, reformalize it um, into the sort of careful aesthetics of modernism then, the small sort of autonomous modernist painting or, or sculpture. Because really for all um, how sort of experimental it, it might look or how many sort of connotations um, people might want to read into the use of materials, I guess um, what's most important to me is just really the formal so it's really just about sort of making a good sculpture, whatever um, that means. But it's like the relationship of um, material to form, to colour, to composition is really um, what I'm most interested in. But so if sculpture is the, the root and the discipline of the work and it gives it edges, I suppose, and contains it because I feel like with all this sort of raw material um, and the prominence that sort of gesture has within the work that it could be, if it's pure gesture, it becomes too self-indulgent, I suppose, and it needs something to, to root it and to give it um, that discipline. Um, so as important as sculpture is to me, I guess the, it's really important to me that it's abstract sculpture. Not just, you know, <clears throat> in the traditional sense of pictorial abstraction, so the way a, 
a painting wouldn't work itself up into a sort of image of representation of the figure or a landscape or an object. It's like this. It does that. So it has. There's no figure in it, and there's no um, representation. But it's also, um, as well as pictorially abstract, it's materially abstract. So um, those sort of traditional art making materials like plaster um, they don't work, work themselves up into any permanence or solidity or structure so I think that's um, how I can say that it's materially abstract so I um, <clears throat> as Jeff said I suppose prioritise material experience over language as a way to sort of uh, understand the world or move through it. And I feel like, um, to, yeah, for me that um, language is a sort of um, inadequate primitive tool for communication. Um, it has such limitations, you know, so I, I think about, for me, sort of language, I suppose words are more abstract also, and um, every sort of human being, you know, has experience before they know what language is of a direct sort of physical relationship to the world, so we know we know material and we know colour and we know form before we know any of the words for those things. So, yeah, kind of like Robert Smithson says, like all oh, um, mental processes come from physical things. So, so I feel like, so in my work, there's no, traditionally um, the image, I suppose, in artwork or say, representation as in, the figure, the landscape, the object, whatever, um, has a relationship to language and in, in through through narrative and through metaphor, I suppose, and maybe when people are looking for sort of meaning in, in an artwork, um, that's the traditional way, I suppose, through metaphor or symbol to some sort of um, narrative or some sort of uh, answer or solution that comes from language but for me so very intentionally there's you know there's no figure um, in it so the person in the work is, is the person looking at it so my work doesn't point outside of itself through sort of um, metaphor or through the symbol to sort of meaning I also feel quite um, confused by, also even by that word in relation to sort of visual art or to, to sculpture, like, and I can't um, relate to that, you know, so instead I don't think about those things. Instead of thinking about what is the meaning of this work, I suppose I sort of think what are the consequences of this work, especially in terms of sculpture being a physical reality and how it therefore affects the the world. Um, one of, one of the consequences of my sculpture is being the um, these sort of loose, messy, raw materials, and the consequences of trying to sort of force that into the institution or into the market or into the gallery. For me, I suppose, I'm trying to um, keep a hold of what I feel like art really is, you know? And for me, I sort of, the root of the work being a sort of psychoanalytic one. But, um, so for me, I suppose, everyone is, thinks about art differently. One of the ways I think about it is as a, like a civilizing of the drives. So I feel like, especially um, the art that I make is like, it's so sort of 
it's behaviour, you know, and it's kind of like behaviour in a place, I guess, that sort of makes it. But I feel like, um, for me, two things are like it's one. I think art is a freedom and it's an escape. I guess maybe they're the same thing. I don't know, but um, I think of that as um, just being quite animal behaviour, and I suppose that in this kind of civilised society in which we live, um, that sort of animal behaviour is, uh, it's fenced off, and it's fenced off um, in places where it's allowed. And so that would be allowed, you know, um, I feel like art is a little sort of fenced off bit of civilization where we are given the permission to behave like the animals we are. So for example, you know, a lot of this work is made by kind of scrabbling around on the, on the floor with powdery materials that are not that it could be earth or it could be plaster powder or, for example, that's this, much of this work is made of toilet paper. Um, but all that sort of scrabbling around in the dirt, that, um, it just depends where you do that. Obviously, that's acceptable within this museum or within the art institution, but if you were to sort of do that out on the street, how the context of that behaviour sort of changes and is no is no longer acceptable. So I guess that's um, how I think of um, art as being this. You know, we've still got this little bit of permission given, like within our sort of increasingly um, sort of crushing and uh, civilised society. Um, and then I suppose in those terms, I also think of it um, as an escape. Um, and in some ways, when I think about that, I think about the differences between painting and sculpture and what that can do for people as an escape. And um, I guess when I think about painting and you think of a, you know, a traditional sort of landscape painting or whatever as a sort of window, it's an, it's an optical cerebral escape. Um, in that sort of window onto another world kind of way. <clears throat> Whereas I feel like, that, and that takes one elsewhere, you know. But sculpture can be as much of an escape, possibly more, um, by way of a sort of um, engulfment or absorption in physical reality in the exact place that we find ourselves here right now, you know, in amongst it. And that sort of engulfment or absorption can be more of an escape, I think. So this, this work is from when I um, represented Scotland at the Venice Biennale in 2011, at the Scottish Pavilion. Um, and so a lot of the work you see that a lot of it's on the floor, you know, so it has, it works on the horizontal plane. And I suppose when I already talked about sort of prioritizing material experience over language as a way to sort of learn about and understand the world or at least just to move through it. Um, and then I spoke about the sort of theoretical root of the work being a psychoanalytic one. I guess it's not, it's not a Freudian psychoanalytic one, it's um, Kleinian, I think. So in that, you know, um, for Freud, I guess the, if we're talking about behavior, like I have been, and if we're talking about the drives, you know, and the fact that I think about art a lot as a sort of um, civilizing of those drives, then that's a very sort of psychoanalytic way to, to think about art. But I'm thinking about, not about Freud as the, I guess it's very much his psychoanalysis, very much language based, very much sort of holds the father as the sort of central figure for meaning. 
And then you have Klein, Melanie Klein is, is his student, but she moves the discipline on. She starts to work most interestingly, I think, with um, babies, small children, people who are either like pre-speech or beyond speech. And she develops this sort of system for sort of gleaning meaning or understanding through um, physical means when she invents the play technique, I guess. And she just invented a really sort of um, basic little set of wooden toys. And she, people, children mostly would sort of play with those toys, but they would also just be the way they were in the room with her was something that she could also interpret. So it's like um, physical reality and how people were sort of um, physically sort of reacting to their concrete environment was something that she could sort of glean some sort of, um, I don't know if it's meaning as such, but I guess it was something that she could in interpret. And so I guess a lot, a lot of my work, I think a lot about sort of the early stages of childhood play and how during that time, I suppose when everyone's first experience, you know, of the physical world or their connection to the physical world is through the, the mother's body. And then I would think, you know, that that moves quite quickly to the floor or the ground. And the amount of sort of learning or development that goes on at that point when we're so close to the ground is more, you know, more brain development, more, uh, experience than you know the rest of our, our lives put together so I feel like when I'm sort of making this work or that's my Turner Prize um, exhibition from 2011 also which was called doesn't care in words and um, I suppose a lot of the time I see I have we know when I'm making the work I'm sort of scrabbling around on the floor I, I don't know if it's like I have memories, but I sort of see, you know, the the earth or water or land, you know, but somehow I feel like I probably have some sort of deep aesthetic sort of visual um, experiences of that from when I was much, much closer to the ground. Um, mm -hmm. This little piece of work there on the right hand side, that's going to be in the exhibition in, in the Arts Centre. Um, there's two parts to the exhibition in the Arts Centre. One in, in this building, Payway, it's all new work. And then in the Meredith Gallery, it's a selection of works from the collection here with older works of mine sort of going back 20 years. Um, that's called Presumption Prevails, and it's from, again, it's in Venice. That's in the Arsenale in Venice. When, when I was speaking about making work as, um, like, some sort of animal behaviour or some sort of freedom or um, really just sort of desire and love for materials that um, I like to think about, and maybe I can sort of join that up to the comments I made in the beginning about the sort of object as a fallacy, the sort of gap between just having a physical relationship to the world and then like actually making something. Um, and I sort of feel like I can, maybe what differentiates one artist's work from another or one of the things is just like where a person stops in the process of making. So I guess I stop, and it's not to say like I stop at the beginning, like it's gestural, or it's just a stream of consciousness, and I, and I don't care what I'm doing, like it's not careful or formal, you know, it's very much, I'm very much sort of obsessed by sort of careful aesthetics and the formal, but um, I guess I, I stop near the beginning of, of, the, of the process, maybe compared to other artists, that, and maybe you have 
something like performance art all the way up to a sort of photo realist painting as a sort of range to, to think about, about where people might sort of begin making something and stop making something. Um, and I sort of feel like, you know, I always say that the, the work tries to elicit at least a sort of impetus towards physical response in the, in the, in the person sort of looking at it or, or experiencing it. And I, I feel like the way I try to do that is I'm, try, I'm trying to keep it open, you know, so by stopping sort of earlier on in the process, by using these sort of raw, loose materials, by having often sometimes even just gaps in, in the work where I feel like, you know, maybe when you see a really good abstract painting, um, sometimes what lets you in are, are the gaps. And um, I mean, yeah, when you can sort of see an agile mind at work and get yourself involved it's like it has to be open there has to be a gap for you i feel like when you know that material is sort of raw or loose and you know that it's not sort of totally solid that you could affect it that you could physically affect it you know you could sort of push the powder around like it gives you that sort of impetus towards physical response, but then the the context within the within the museum or the gallery, we all know, you know, it's not interactive artwork. So, like we know, we're not supposed to touch the thing, but the fact that you know if you did that it would move, feels like that somehow sort of relates back to that idea about the civilizing of the drives being something to do with what art is because if, if you look at something like that that's sort of raw and open and loose and you have a sort of visceral reaction towards it or would want to sort of touch it or move it but then you have to not do that because of the rules of society or the context of the art world or whatever it, it forces a physical experience, a sort of gut bodily experience to then become, to transform itself into a cerebral optical one, which in some ways is, is a kind of sort of absolute illustration of the, of the civilising of the drives, you know? When you, you know, when I was saying earlier on that it's, it's quite difficult sometimes to see that that's a sculpture, like it's not an installation, it's not performance art, it's not a painting, but it has skirted very close to those things and then pulled itself back um, towards being a sort of autonomous sculpture that has edges and has titles. And, you know, in a similar way, when I was speaking about the work being open or um, wanting to just elicit at least a sort of impetus towards physical response, I think a lot sometimes, you know, what's the point in making anything at all? Especially if, if and as, you know, the object is a fallacy that um, material is just sort of flying, flying together and flying apart and we have these little, what look like little solid sort of permanent object moments to us. And um, I, f I feel like the more you make something or the more you sort of work it up into something, it's like a loss, you know, the, the, the more you lose of the sort of authenticity of the, of the physical world or something. And I think a lot about um, sort of ancient art or whatever, and I think about sort of how an, the anthropologists sort of decide when, what, how, you know, what is the first piece of art that's ever made? How can they say, oh yes, this little scratched piece of ochre from 70,000 years ago that's found in South Africa. Oh, this is the first, this is art, you know, because it has these um, little sort of marks scraped onto the side. And just the fact that, just that sort of impetus, you know, that in a, and I think a lot about that gap in between sort of wanting to make something or wanting to touch something and just sort of reach out into the world, what's the difference or how much of a gap is there between sort of that 
and then actually working something up, like making something. And, and for me, I don't, and so I don't see that as a gain. I think I see, I see that as a loss, you know. And I think about, like the there's these caves in um, South Australia that have inside them this um, material that's called moon milk, and it um, it's a sort of precipitate of a carbonate material. So it's close to sort of limestone or even plaster or something like that, you know. But um, because of the climate inside the caves, it just, it never dries. So there's marks on the wall where people have just, there's different marks in the caves, but there's somewhere people have just sort of reached it and just dragged their finger, their fingers down the wall. But because, you know, that was 30,000 years ago and because the material will never dry, it's, you know, that's still there, that mark, that wet mark. And there's some areas of the cave where there's handprints or they've worked their marks up more up into, like, what look like patterns or whatever. Um, I've been sort of trying all the time to... <sighs> how do I get, how do I sort of make paint that never dries or how do I, um, yeah, use plaster that never sort of solidifies or whatever because, and I found, you know, I sort of um, mix paint with Vaseline and use it so that the paint will never dry. I often feel like when the paint's dry that the object or the painting is sort of dead or it seems dead, you know, and I'm trying to um, use my materials to, I suppose it's like to try to keep what I think art really is, is like that sort of raw, animal, creative um, moment. And I suppose where we are just now in sort of contemporary art history, whatever, or what the art world's like, just that it just gets more and more difficult for those create, raw, creative moments to exist, especially because you know, the art fair is now king and that's like often where people see artwork and that, you know, their commercial is so connected to the market. Commercial galleries are showing there and oftentimes it's only people who have representation by a commercial gallery who would be given a, an exhibition in an institution or... So we're in a sort of difficult place where the transferable, hermetically sealed object like the sculpture on a plinth or the painting in a frame is much more what's required of us but um, obviously I'm trying to have when I speak about um, it's difficult for me to connect myself to what the meaning of the work might be but certainly I hope that the consequences of those sculptures are a real sort of forcing of that sort of raw creative moment into the museum, into the market, into the gallery, so that it can um, continue to exist. So, hi, everybody. It's Jill over here on the side, so you just don't see this, hear, hear this voice and not know where it's coming from. So as you, you may know, I'll just remind you, um, Carla's exhibition opens next Friday. I hope that many of you will come back, that you're super intrigued to see what it is that she's creating in the space right above us, and then right out those doors over there. It'll be really fascinating to see what she, the sculptures that she's made, and the way that some of her works are in dialogue with some pieces from the permanent collection in the um, Anna K. Meredith Gallery, our main gallery. So please come back for that. Um, so while you are all processing a question, if you have a question, certainly raise your hand. I'm on this side, Megan's on the other side. Um, I've had a little bit of time with some of the essays that have been written that will be in a catalog um, that will accompany this exhibition. It'll, the catalog will probably come out maybe in April towards the, towards the end of the run of the show. But Carla, there was something that when I read it in one of the essays, I, I wanted to ask you about. So I know you haven't had the um, advantage of reading the catalog yet, and Carla, this might take you a little bit by surprise, but um, this was in the essay written by Jenny Sorkin. And she says, for black, the work begins in the studio even if it is finished on site. Working on site over a long period of time, the living artist potentially becomes an affront to an institution, regardless of how welcoming it is, because she simply doesn't belong there making a mess. There is already a staff devoted to carrying 
out and executing a large-scale artwork, in effect, deadening it. And she was talking about this in relationship to Virginia Woolf's A Room of One's Own, so that's kind of the context of what it is in the essay. But I wondered what you thought about, does, is there a deadening effect and how you would respond to that? in the museum space? Because I heard, feel like I heard you say in the lecture that there's a kind of a permission that yeah. the museum allows. Yeah. Well, yes, was it's a difficult thing to talk about because um, it, it relates to when I was talking about when the more you make something or the more you work it up into something, like for me, that seems like a loss rather than a gain, so it's like, and then just also sort of relating that to that whole sort of civilized society thing of like, this is where you can make your art, you know? And then I was, you know, I always think back to when I first had a studio, like before I even went to art school, and I still had, a, you know, I had a job, as I, it it's irrelevant, but anyway, sort of, I, used, I was a journalist on a local newspaper. Doesn't matter when I was like a late, in my late teens, sort of early twenties, and then I had this. I got this studio that I um, would go to sort of every night after work and at the weekends. And like I remember just sitting there one night or whatever, just scraping into some clay on that was on the desk with a little sort of scalpel or whatever, or a bit of a Stanley knife, and just thinking. Um, to myself, like that's enough, you know. If I just if I just did that, <laughs> if I just did that forever, that would be enough, you know. And in some ways, like it's really, it's hard to think. It sounds really stupid to say, because it's like, you know, I get to do this, and I get to, you know, I've sort of clung on to it to the extent where I get to make art and I get to sort of be in these institutions and make a show and even, you know, I sort of treat it like my studio, but, <clears throat> um, but yeah, there's a sort of massive loss between that sort of activity and what it then means to, to ha sort of have an exhibition here or anywhere. And um, it's just a, I guess it's just it, it's a hard choice for any artist. It's like sometimes like the more opportunity you might have to have an exhibition, like the actual the less opportunity you have personally to make your to make work, and that your that sort of direct relationship to the physical world that I had sort of love in my life gets less and less because it's not. It's like that thing when I was saying about. Um, I want the consequences of my work to be that to sort of ram that kind of um, those sort of loose raw materials like into the institution, into the market, you know, because it's no one's fault. You know what I mean, but that's just like it's it's what our society and our culture is like now in, in the West, and I think um, you know people think that they want art and. It, institutions think that they want to show art and like art fairs and galleries think they want to sell art but re I think really there's a real sort of the truth is that they you know that people or at least you know institutions and this sort of structure doesn't really want art because what it, it's a really you know what they don't want what it really is which is a really sort of difficult messy chaotic business, you know. I think sometimes people probably want the shiny object at, at the end of it, which may or may not be the thing that gets made. I don't know if that answers your question. It doesn't really, does it? I'm not, I'm not so interested in arriving yeah. at a final answer. Yeah. I'm just, I think we're, he, we're interested to kind of hear your thoughts on things, so that's okay. I, it, it helps. Okay. <laughs> Would anyone else like to have, hear some thoughts? Yeah. I, um, I was just wondering if you could speak to the process and like how you assembled that <clears throat> and how long each, I don't know, just kind of like walk through how you built that, I guess. Um, just in this space, what would you, um, so, well, 
if it, like Jill said, I suppose oftentimes it will begin in the studio. So sometimes what happens in the studio is just the preparation of materials. I guess sometimes some things are made. Like I think for that exhibition that's in the ICA um, Philadelphia and it's called Practically in Shadow and it's supposed to be a, just one sculpture, a sculpture, whatever. But the, the bit on the top of the cube, so I made that in the studio, it's just cellophane twisted into circles, wrapped with sellotape, all put, you know, sellotape together. And then, so that would have been made in the studio and brought there. And then the bit at the back um, is all made out of like polythene and the way there's a work made out of polythene and chalk dust in, in this show uh, that's from, I don't know, it's maybe from about 10 years ago or something. But the way I would make those was I would get, you know, like polythene dust sheets, put it in a bin bag, or what you call a trash bag. Um, and either I'd smash up some chalk for the colour or I would, I got a bit wiser later on, I just used powder paints, the same thing. It took me a while to realise that. And then put the powder colour and the polythene in the bag and I'd shake it up like that. And then take it out and then, because I would always be trying to, as much as I say, I do that with colour as well, I want to sort of, almost make a sculpture or only just make a sculpture and I want to do that with colour as well so it's trying to be as close to nothing sometimes as it can be so the the colour is also very light so just pink or it's like just blue but it's sort of like only just getting there and I think about the object as a fallacy and then I often think about the fact that colour doesn't exist because it's just a trick of the light whatever there's no colour in the dark and then so then the powder just clings to it, so it has this really sort of ephemeral colour, because really it's just lots of powder sort of clinging to the polythene. And then I just um, make each individual sheet, then take it there to the museum, and then I made it, just tied it all together there. It's just tied to make the forms. And then the powder is like plaster mixed with like blue powder paint. So would have mixed that there and me and one or two assistants put, put it out with a sieve, just like a baking sieve that you would make a cake with, whatever. And then I kept that bit there was trying to sort of get um, some volume to the powder. I think it might, it's just polystyrene that's under there. And so it's just powder on top of that and then the details and stuff are like bath bombs from Lush, you know. There's, but they, again, it's just like a pow it's like a form made of powder. But I buy a lot of that kind of stuff and take it there. And then I roll them. So there's a, sort of those sort of performancey aspects in the sculpture where um, on the big blue bit there's lots of sort of pink um, nail varnish sort of dribbled over it that it sort of bounces on top of the powder because it can't absorb and it doesn't know what to do and it's sort of like that, um, <coughs> what do you call it, like mercury sort of a bit, kind of bounces about and then just becomes droplets and then I would roll those, those bath bombs over it to get those lines and stuff. So it's like all that sort of expressive gesture that sort of, um, you know, relates it to sort of abstract expressionism and that you know performance art all that to have again to sort of so that it's like a sort of fit to have that visceral connection to it you know the sort of that you can see the hand and that it's all sort of still raw and yeah I have um, two or three questions about process do you make preliminary drawings no and when you're invited by an institution um, it, it's a, entirely improvised at the time, or is there advanced, is, is there some collaboration with the institution as far as what you're going to do? And the third question, maybe you can answer with a yes or no, is do you wear a respirator since you're oh, yeah, yeah. dealing with so much powder? Yeah. Yeah. But talk to us about um, when you're 
collaborating when you're doing an installation in a yeah. piece in a museum? So um, I don't do any drawings, and um, I guess I, just because it's like um, I just want to sort of well, it wouldn't have any relationship, you know, because it's not like it's sort of structural or, or something, or that you could. It's I would have a sort of what might be described as an idea. I don't know. Or I think I'm going to use, or if I go maybe to do a site visit. So I was here last year, and then I would think, okay, so maybe I use these colours and these materials. I'll sort of try and do this, and then um, I'll try to. So I want to just sort of act in that in that sort of physical reality. Um, so. The work has to happen in the space, and it could, even if it was started or I thought about it, it would become, it might become completely something else. You just realise, oh, that's not possible at all. That was just an idea, and this is what's going to happen. Or it could be quite close to what I thought it was going to be. Um, and I'll try to. This is one of the things that takes that um, that takes it all away from me, right? No, that wants to complete. But because I find it really, really painful, right, to, to use words and to have to talk about art, but more than that, to have to talk about how you get, what are you going to do, how you're going to do it, the practicalities of what it, what it is you need, and to have to communicate that, it's just really, yeah, that's just really, really painful, you know, because you just because you just want to go like that, that's all I want to do, I can't, I find, anyway, but so you have to do that. So then I would try to explain to someone uh, what I want to do, and then there would be the practicalities of that, of them getting those materials, or, but there is no sort of collaboration as such. I think what um, happens is if people or want to work with me, or if an institution invites me, they sort of know what they're dealing with to a certain extent. And basically, I want to say, can I do? Can I do what I want in in that gallery? You know, because there's no other way I would know how how to do it. I can't, you know, I don't know how to collaborate or whatever. Yeah. So here I am. Oh, hi. I'm really fascinated by your example of the moon milk and the fact that it lasted a really long time. It never dried. Yeah. And, and your statement that if it dried, it would be dead. But yet you're using material that by their very nature is going to probably um, fall apart or deconstruct. Mm -hmm. How concerned are you about permanence in your work? Okay, right. So... <laughs> Um, very concerned. <laughs> this is a with my work. What you find is, I guess, there's lots of contradictions, right? And then, so it's very sort of paradoxical. So I would say, I'm very concerned with permanence, and I want nothing more than to make a permanent sort of mark. So when when I've made something, I just want it to stay like that, you know. So. Then there's the ridiculousness of, well, I am well aware that if, if that's really true, then, you know, there's materials that you can use to achieve that. So I should be using wood or bronze or whatever. Um, but I guess, oh, it, it just comes back to like all these things, you know, it can sort of look like a choice what you're doing, or it can, or you might presume it's a choice, or you might presume that um, someone knows what they're doing or has chosen a certain path. But it's just like there's just compromises to to be made, like with everything else, you know. The limitations even that drive me mad are things like just, you know, gravity. There's so many sort of physical limitations to what you can. Achieve, and I think I made a decision at a certain point quite a long time ago that, um, you know, it drives me mad and it frustrates me so much, like, that 
that something won't, with well, the materials I use won't s maybe stay exactly how I want it to over time. But I made the choice that it, it was more important to me to have the life and to have the energy in it that I just felt that I lost with those other materials. I'm not saying like I love all, you know, so, you know, all different kinds of art and I love sculpture and I love, you know, I love stone and metal and wood. Anyway, but I just felt like that was the choice that I had to make to have this sort of life and energy that I had to use these materials. But it's really sort of complex how it... So I feel like when I make a piece of work that it is permanent. So it, for all, often my work might be described as sort of impermanent or fragile. or. But you'll sort of see in the, in the exhibition... Um, in the gallery that has all the collection works and my works that it goes, you know, it goes back. You see works that's 10 years old, 15, 20, it's not. Um, and I mean, it's not so interesting. I don't think to talk about it because they're just practicalities, but the way I've dealt with it over the years is that we have, so, when I make a piece of work, it's finished, it's permanent, it can be sold, it can be owned by an institution, it can be shown again. Some works you'll see are kind of are transferable objects, even if they're paper sculptures, they come out of the studio, they go in a crate, they're shown in an exhibition. That you might have, that bit still exists, that bit still exists, and then there's a whole recipe about how you make the powder. So I've got powder floor works that are in the collection of like, for example, there's a white one with a lot of detail that's in the Hammer Museum in LA, and they, that there's all different sort of categories of my work, but say for example the powder floor works in some ways it's like baking a cake, like there's there's a recipe, how you mix the powder, how you make the colour. It goes it's so detailed, like oh there's so many sort of contracts and guidelines and documents around my work, you know. And it's even like where did you buy the powder? But it's broken down into its chemical compounds in case that business goes out of uh, doesn't exist in 10 years or whatever, you can make it. Anyway, that kind of stuff, but that drives me mad because it's like, I, I, you know, I really hate instruction. I hate, I'm not interested in that. I don't see it as part of the work. It's just a sort of, it's a practical necessity, you know, and it's, and then, so then it becomes why I make the work and it's this sort of loose free thing that at least to begin with, comes out of this sort of unconscious and, the, and then and you can be free to do what you want. And as soon as it's finished and it's permanent, then it's like all the rules and the full weight of, you know, um, of the sort of the market and the institution and the what's required of, of it in society comes into play and again that's the sort of compromise I made early on or it's the way I decided to do it you know I could and it might be sort of more freeing and more authentic like I could make this work I could put it all in the bin some of it does you know there are some pieces of work that I would make and then throw away <clears throat> but it just comes down to sort of making artwork in a sort of in a um capitalist society that's not my choice you know we just we find ourselves here I have to live and also that's kind of that's what it is it's not that's not really what I want it to be but I could have you know there's people who make work and they and it's so pure you know and like that they would you know they would make their living they would teach and they would keep making the work and it would be really and I yeah, I don't do that. I, deci I decided to, with the opportunity that came, that I, that I would, um, that it would enter the market and that it would enter the system and that I would, I want it to have a life as well. I do want it um, to remain sort of thing, but it's not, yeah, it is a, it's a, it's not straightforward, yeah. It's problematic. Oh, yeah. Hello. Hi. Um, well, first, it's gorgeous what you do. I really love it. Thank you. Um, and I have a question regarding colors you're using. Mm -hmm. So you seem very consistent through all your art 
with the palette of color you're using. Mm -hmm. And I've been curious if within virtual projects, you would include probably another a fifth pastel color in your palettes or even completely switch to another palette and going to more saturated color mm -hmm. or is this is your style kind of a forever and you will remain consistent regardless projects? Um, so I guess my relationship to color is that just what I spoke about earlier or is um, why it's so light is um, I guess for me, like, yeah, it's like colour as a material, I, th I think, as well. And, um, like, it's, it's, it, it's a communication, like, it's really emotional and it's a communication that can do. It's really important to me, not what colour, like, all, all colours, I could use all colours, but it's to do with them, but the tone of the colour, it's really important. You can imagine, like, how, so I'd say, I'm trying to do sort of almost pink or only just pink or almost blue, only just blue because it, it's also about, like it has that, there's loads of sort of connotations that of those kind of colours like baby products like re and really sort of visceral kind of material and emotional stuff. Um, also sort of about um, attractiveness or something as well so if you imagine with this work like how easy it is to what color does um in terms of like the object so i use these materials that are sort of really uh, loose and raw and maybe they'd be the creams and the gels and the oils would maybe be a sort of gloopy and you know or you'd have this sort of loose powder that could really easily be disgusting you know and so I'm not, I'm not into like the abject as an aesthetic. That's not what I'm trying to do. And I don't want to sort of evoke decay or anything like that, which is really easy to do with these materials. Really easy to just put a little bit too much red in the pink and all of a sudden it's very meaty and bloody. <laughs> uh, you know, and the other colours whatever other connotation. Um, so I really need to sort of stay on that side of lightness and, and stay on that side of the attractiveness um, because of the materials that are being used. If I want it to have, that's the aesthetic I want it to have. I don't want it to spill over into the abject. So I don't go dark, apart from when I use, like, natural. I've used quite a lot of earth. So... And, and it's sort of nat in, the, in its natural colour. And then I've used plasters in their natural colour, so some like light brown. Um, Try to think what else, but I haven't, yeah, no. I don't, and I, <clears throat> I don't know what I would do, like what's, I don't really know what's coming, like whether um, the colour will always be like that or not, I don't know. I just know why I needed it to be like that then. No, but. I think we had one more question here. So I'm curious about the, your thinking about selecting the works from our collection. Mm -hmm. I haven't been able to see it yet, but I did read the essay, so I know a little bit about the works you chose. Tell us a little bit about the process and your thinking of, um, when you selected the works from our collection to show in this exhibit, please. Okay. <clears throat> so, well, <clears throat> I guess um, all different of the works for all different reasons. And um, I guess the most obvious ones are the things like, maybe the first ones to choose are the Helen Frankenthaler paintings. So. I, I, you know, I love Helen Frankenthaler. I guess one of the things that's important about my work is just how, it, well, it's not important about my work, that's not, but just how much I love art in, in general and most of it or all of it. Um, and, I th yeah, I have a sort of big relationship to 
American painting, I think, and to abstract expressionism and to colour field painting, I guess, I suppose, as well, um, and any sort of gestural painting. So I knew the Frankenthalers were here. That was the first thing that I wanted to have. And I, I think I'll, there's two, it's quite difficult to explain. I would have to go sort of deeply into both things. But um, one thing is that when I'm, my work is sculpture, I, but it would seem to me that the process of, of making it is very painterly. So, and often, in a really sort of contradictory way, I will think, how, how do I know that a work is finished? Just in my own mind, a lot of the time I'll be thinking, if this was a painting, would it be a good painting? I'll be thinking, if this was an abstract painting, is it a good one? And then the big example, one of the big examples in my mind for that would be Helen Frankenthaler, and it would also be like Morris Lewis, Clifford Still. So there's a Morris Lewis painting in the show, there's two Helen Frankenthalers. Um, but I guess it's just how, how much of a relationship it has to art history and maybe specifically to sort of American um, high modernism, early postmodernism. One of the things is that I, th I think about or have thought about a lot, so you'll see in the work like there's a Carly Schneeman. Um, there's an Ellen Gallagher, I know that, I mean, that's something else, but I would be thinking a lot about, um, like, gesture and what that is in art and what that is in the history of art. Loose gesture and sort of expression with materials and colour. And a lot of the time that would be, I guess, it's emotion or something, or expresses emotion and... I would think a lot about abstract expressionism and someone like Jackson Pollock. There's not a Jackson Pollock painting in the show, but when a man... I don't know how to... There's, too, there's sort of too much to say, but I'll try to sort of say it like that I had this... thing. Things are different now, I think, to you know, even to what they were when I was sort of starting out, and I had this... You know, I wanted to make, like, this... I guess like to, to be a sort of great artist or something or to make a great piece of work. Like I, I always had this, in my mind, this room in the Met in New York and it's the room that has like the David Smith sculptures and the Clifford Still paintings. And that sort of idea of that, like the great male artist and that sort of um, aspiration towards maleness or something, towards the, to, the, to that sort of scale and that sort of, gesture and that sort of expression of the sort of great male artists or something of those times. And then, so if I think about like that sort of gesture, um, loose gesture in art, I think about emotion and then I think about when it's a man doing that, when it's Jackson Pollock or something, that it's anger, it would seem, and that it could be like, it's sort of like righteous anger. And then when that same sort of, gesture and that kind of, you know, that sort of bodily expression and the loose, with the loose material and it, you know, finds its way from there into um, something like feminist performance. Carly Schneeman, for example, there's a work, you know, of hers in, in the show, that that then, that same sort of raw emotion doesn't have the righteousness in it, like the cultural judgment of that becomes, you know, like a sort of hysteria, like something unacceptable of the of the body, like something to be looked away from. So I guess, like in in the show, you've got those sort of visceral, thing, you know, there's like Eva Hesse, um, Carly Schneeman, and maybe I would feel that sort of relationship with, and then you've got the you know, the Morris Lewis, and then you've got Helen Frankenthaler, of often sort of seen as the bridge between abstract expressionism and sort of colour field painting or something, because instead of having, like, the, you know, 
I think like she's a really, really important, amazing artist. I guess that's coming to the fore a bit more now, but just that thing as a woman painter, like it didn't have the, she wasn't given that sort of weight of seriousness, I think, from her, for her gestures. So that's in there. And often I would go, you know, visit museums and never see a Helen Frankenthaler or see one but then see a whole room of like Clifford Still or Morris Lewis or something. But each, and it's hard to explain the whole thing, so we've got Richard Tuttle, and then we've got Klaus Oldenburg, one of the big plugs. But it goes back to, there's like a Jean de Buffet, there's like Mary Cassatt, there's like drawings of, of uh, women and children, really, and Marie Lauren Sand, and they're sort of like, they're, knit like all kind of outside of the gallery like as though as though they're a problem uh, yeah anyway i can't really tie up the whole <laughs> there's many reasons but well i think i think there are lots of consequences for us to go and like anticipate going into this exhibition and seeing those juxtapositions or that how the work is in dialogue and certainly when we see the major uh, sculptures in the I am pay wing i think i know we're going to approach them differently with thinking about resisting what is the meaning here but rather what is the consequence of seeing this in this space and how is it interacting with the space so thank you for letting us in your mind a little bit we really appreciate it thanks for having me